thank you very much. I um, was witness a few moments ago to an, an interesting and informative exchange and wanted to comment on that briefly. Um, both the leader and the senior senator from New York had some comments that I think are important to, uh, in the context of what's being discussed here today. But I, I really wanted to come to the floor today because we've been getting a lot of phone calls and letters from people back home that are wondering deeply what this is all about. And these are folks that are out working every day and raising their families and running their businesses. And they want to really understand what the debate here is about. They, they get the gist of it, that there's this debt limit fight and that Congress, if it doesn't do anything, we may not be able to pay some bills beginning August 2nd. But what really is behind all of this? And the best way to explain it to people is to equate it to lives of real people in the real world. And every single one of us as adults has a, a credit rating. In essence, uh, there are two or three companies out there that basically rate you as an individual. And what they do is they give you a credit rating that determines, number one, whether you're willing to pay back, and number two, whether you have the money to pay people back. And based on that, you get a, something called the credit score. People are familiar with that. Every time you try to go lease or buy a car or buy a house or anything on credit, they're going to run your credit. And it's going to tell them, this is John Smith, uh, this is so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, this is his credit rating. And based on that, people will decide whether to lend you money or not. Well, countries have credit ratings too. And it's based on two things. Number one is your history of paying people back. And two, on your ability to pay them back in the future. And there are three major companies in the world that give credit ratings to countries. Three major companies. And what those companies are saying right now is that we're looking at America and we are worried. We're worried about two things. They are worried about this debt limit issue and the fact that if the debt limit's not raised, they're going to downgrade us because we're going to miss payments on this, that, or the other. They are worried about that. But they're a lot more worried about something else. And it's not our willingness to pay back, it's our ability to pay back people that lend money to the United States. Let me read you some of the quotes. This is from Moody's, which is one of the top ones. They write, government will avoid, they will, if the government avoids default, we will likely affirm America's AAA rating. America has the top highest credit rating in the world right now that you could possibly get. And it says if we avoid default, they will likely affirm our AAA rating but they will still assign us on something called the negative outlook unless there is, and this is the money line, substantial and credible budget agreement to cut the deficit. So what they're basically saying is, if you raise the debt limit, you may temporarily avoid being downgraded, but ultimately we're still putting you on a watch list and we're ultimately still going to downgrade you unless you have a substantial and credible budget agreement to cut the deficit. Now, what does that mean? They go on to elaborate. They say, well, that agreement should include deficit, a deficit trajectory, basically a path of deficits that leads to a stabilization and ultimately a decline in your deficit, particularly in how much money you owe compared to how big your economy is. That's what they want us to see. What they want to see is they want to see a plan in place that shows how we stop growing the deficit and then how we start reducing it. That's what they're saying. And then they actually talk about specific numbers. And they have said, their analysts have said, we think $1.5 trillion of cuts this year and over the next 10 years is a plan that's too little. We think $4 trillion might be enough. That's from Moody's. Standard & Poor's, the other rating company, they wrote very clearly that even if the parties, meaning Republicans and Democrats, even if they agree to raise the debt limit, it may not be enough to avoid downgrade. That's the second credit, uh, credit house. They're saying even if you raise the debt limit, we may still downgrade you. And in order to avoid a downgrade, you need a plan that reduces annual budget deficits by at least $4 trillion over the next 10 years. We hear the $4 trillion number again. This is the second rating company basically saying, yeah, the debt limit is a problem, but what we're really worried about is do you have a plan to deal with the debt and the deficits? And then the third major company called Fitch, what they wrote is that we're looking for an agreement on credible fiscal consolidation strategy in order to secure America's top credit rating, the AAA. So the three major houses, which is what this is all about at the end of the day, because if our credit rating goes down, interest payments go up on everything from your mortgage to your car, but more importantly, on America's debt, which means we're going to have to borrow more money just to pay the interest on the debt we already owe. So we can't allow our credit rating to go down. And the three major companies that give us our credit rating are all saying the same thing. And here's what they're saying in plain English. The debt limit is a problem, but it is the least of your problems. Your bigger problem is the debt. And if all you do is pass an increase to the debt limit and it doesn't come with a serious, credible, substantial plan to deal with the debt, you're in big trouble. And so I would submit to you that the biggest issue facing us on this issue is not the debt limit. The debt limit is actually the easiest issue. That's one vote away from being raised. Our biggest issue is the debt. 
And the fact is that as we speak, there's no plan in place to begin to do anything about it. Our credit is in danger because of this. And that's what we should be focused on like a laser. Now, what, is, what will it take? What will a substantial plan look like? Let's take it from the own words of these credit companies. It has to, it has to stabilize deficits and begin to show how the deficits come down. We know that $1.5 trillion in cuts is not enough. We know that $4 trillion might be enough. So this is what we need to do. So how do you do this? How do you get there? It's not rocket science. It's a pretty simple mix of two things that have to happen. The first thing you have to do is you have to stop spending money the rate you're spending. And now, in essence, you can't keep spending more money than you have. If you're in debt and you keep borrowing a lot more money than you take in, especially, it's only going to get worse. So you've got to control the amount of money that you spend. And the other thing you've got to do is generate more money for government. So if you could do those two things, if you could control how much you spend and you can generate more money for government and you can do both things at the same time, that's how you dig yourself out of this. And the debate we should be having here is how do you accomplish that? And so on the, more, on the, on the don't spend side, we really have two choices. You can either trust that future Congresses will do what virtually no Congress in the history of this nation has ever done, and that is control themselves. And I say this because when Republicans were in charge, Democrats were in charge, they've never been able to control the spending money. If you let politicians spend money that they don't have, they will spend it. And I don't care who's in charge. That's what history teaches us. So we can either trust that somehow in the future, Congress won't do that, or we can put into law limits on their ability to do that. And that's why, I, 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 that's why I'm for things like a spending cap and a balanced budget amendment. Because I think if you don't have restrictions in place, it isn't going to happen. Almost every state in the country has a balanced budget amendment. I come from a state where there's a balanced budget amendment. I assure you, I don't care who's in charge or how conservative they claim to be. If you don't have laws in place that keep politicians from spending money that they're borrowing, they will borrow the money and spend it. And history will back that up. The second issue is how do you generate more money for this controlled government? And that's the crux of the debate we're having here today. Some of my colleagues believe the way you do it is you raise taxes, especially on rich people. To some people, that may sound appealing. Here's the problem. It doesn't raise nearly enough money, if you could even collect it. It doesn't raise nearly enough money. Now, from the only tax plans that I have seen put out there by the administration and some of my colleagues here on the other side of the aisle, it adds up to less than 10 days' worth of deficit spending. We do know, however, that these in increases in taxes could kill jobs. The other way you could generate more revenue for government, and it's the way I think we should do it, is you grow your economy. You get more people back to work, and so now more people are paying taxes. You get people that are working to make more money because their businesses are doing better, and so they're paying more taxes. Re and the government uses that money not to grow government. It uses that money to pay down its debt and control itself. And how do you create more jobs and economic growth? You do it by encouraging people, not in this building, but outside this building. Encouraging them to start businesses or grow existing businesses. And if you ask those people, not economists, not people on Wall Street, not journalists, not professors, not politicians, if you ask people that create jobs, what would it take for you to start creating jobs again? What they're looking for is a tax system that's fair and regulations they can comply with and then just get out of their way and they'll go do what Americans have always done. So those are our ideas. Here's the problem. Even as we stand here today, there's few, few plans on the table to do it. Now, I've watched the president give press conferences, I've watched the president give speeches, but I have yet to see a plan from the president. And with all due respect to my colleagues in the other party here in the Senate, I haven't seen a plan from them either. They're the majority party, they control this chamber, they control the Senate. And I haven't seen a plan from them. A moment ago we heard this talk about we have to compromise. It's really hard to compromise when the other side doesn't have a plan. What do you compromise on? Where is your plan? You can't compromise if only one person is offering plans. There is only one plan that has been voted on by any House to deal with this issue, and it's the one we're on right now, cut, cap, and balance. I would submit that if you don't like cut, cap, and balance, if you don't think we need to cut spending, cap spending, and balance our budget, then show us your alternative. Or maybe you do believe we need to cut, cap, and balance, but you don't like the way this bill cuts spending, cap spending, and balance and spending, fine. Offer your version of cut, cap, and balance. Let's proceed to this bill. Let's get on this bill that the House has passed, and if you don't like it, change it. You've got the votes here to do it. If you've got a better idea, bring this bill up and amend it and put your ideas on it. But how could you ask for compromise? How could you ask the House? How could you scold Republicans in the House for refusing to compromise if you don't have a plan of your own? 
How can you compromise if you don't have any ideas of your own? It's not a fair thing to say. And so I would urge the leadership of this chamber and the President of the United States to offer their ideas on paper. Put your ideas on paper and offer them so we can begin to work on this concept of compromise that you've offered. Because you can't compromise and you can't negotiate with people that will not offer a plan. Let's get, why don't you vote to proceed to cut cap and balance? Proceed to this bill so we could have a debate on this bill and so you could offer your ideas on this bill. This is the perfect opportunity to do it. Let's stop negotiating in the media and through press conferences and start doing it here on this floor, which is what people sent us here to do. And I hope that that's what will happen.